The Welcome everyone. We're just getting everyone into our room right now. I can see the names popping up. Thank you so much. You've got a great group here today. I know we're also going to be streaming in Uptown Normal. So hello to Uptown. We'll give folks just a minute here or two to get settled in and get logged in. All right, we'll give folks another minute here and then we'll go ahead and get started. I think you can also turn on the um, transcription. It should be a... Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Oh, I think it's on. Annotation or, I don't know. There. There we go. Live transcript, yep, there we go. Okay, well with that, we will go ahead and get started. So good morning and thank you everyone for joining us here today. We are streaming live from the Challenger Learning Center over at Heartland Community College. We are so excited to be welcoming today Dr. Vieira from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's an observational cosmologist in the departments of astronomy and physics. He received his undergraduate degree in astrophysics from UCLA, his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago, where he was part of the team that built and deployed the South Pole Telescope. He held a postdoctoral research position at Caltech before starting his faculty position at the University of Illinois in 2013. He is a co-author on more than 200 scientific papers and has more than 20,000 citations to his work. Professor uh, Vieira is a co-principal investigator of the James Webb Space Telescope Director's Discretionary Early Release Program called Templates, which will observe four high redshift strongly lens galaxies. These observations will be among the very first observations made with the James Webb Telescope that you're going to be hearing about today. That data is going to be made public immediately after it's collected, which is so exciting. He's also a co-investigator on a number of James Webb Space Telescope Cycle 1 general observer programs. And we are just, again, thrilled that he can be here today sharing information with you about the telescope, his research, his work. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Vieira. We will be taking questions at the end. So if you do have any questions um, that you'd like to ask Dr. Vieira, you can go ahead and type them into the chat or the Q&A section, and then we'll get to those at the very end. So with that, Dr. Vieira, it's all yours. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. And actually, we're going to take kind of a meandering, meandering tour to get to it, just so we can tell you kind of the history and context for why this is going to be such an important and exciting mission. Um, so uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which I'll call JWST from now on, or Webb, has been in development for more than 20 years. Um, I remember when I was a graduate student um, in the early 2000s, 
it was about to launch. Um, and it's still about to launch, but now it seems like for real, for real, it's going to launch in about a month. Um, I think it, October 30th. So um, I'm, I'm really excited, particularly because um, I, I get to be one of the first people to use it. Um, and that's a real privilege and a treat. And it's, it's like having a, your own personal toy and you get to be the first one to use it before all the other kids. So it's, it's really cool. Um, and it's going to do amazing science and it's going to revolutionize our view of the universe. So let's, let's see if I can work this thing. Okay, so let's start here, way back in time, um, to the night sky. And it's hard to see now because there's so much light pollution and we're just kind of not accustomed to looking up. Um, but go look up tonight at right at sunset and you'll be able to see if you look right where the sun set, look up and you'll see Venus. Okay, it's the only, it's the brightest thing on the sky after the sun. And then follow the ecliptic, the line in the sky that the sun and the moon move across every day. And you'll see two other bright spots. And if you do this right before the stars come out, it's really obvious and they're so bright. They're brighter than the stars. You'll see Jupiter and Saturn, okay? So the ancients, people, you know, pre-literate societies would have known about these objects because they're so bright and so obvious and so apparent. Okay, so that's where I'm starting my journey. It's just looking out at the sky and you can see our place in the cosmos. So the solar system is shaped like a pancake. All the planets move in the same direction and in one plane, okay? And so that's why on the sky, on the ecliptic, you see all the planets always on the same line in the sky. And it's the same line in the sky that the sun and the moon also move across because everything's moving around in this plane, okay? Now, the first person to kind of see beyond what we can see with the naked eye was Galileo. Um, Galileo lived um, in the 1500s um, to 1600s, and he was the first person to use a telescope and point it at the sky. Not the first one to use a telescope, but the first person to point it at the sky. And with this, he provided proof that the Earth was not the center of the universe and that the Earth orbits around the sun. So this, this is, I, I'm, I'm telling the story is kind of to show you the legacy of telescopes and how they have revolutionized our view of the universe. Um, with this telescope, and this telescope was not very fancy, he, he polished the lenses by hand, he built this thing by hand, and that, that's a replica of it on the left. With this telescope, he discovered um, that there are moons around Jupiter. This immediately implied that the Earth is not the center of the universe because there are moons going around Jupiter. He saw phases of Venus. This showed conclusively that Venus goes around the sun, not the Earth. And he saw craters on the moon, which meant that celestial objects were not perfect spheres that people had assumed before. This is an image that my colleague took with a modest kind of amateur telescope. He probably wouldn't like me describing it that way, but this, was not, this is not a professional telescope. This is a, um, and you can see this with binoculars um, or even the simplest telescope. So you can see this. Um, I took photos as well, but he, he did better ones. Um, this was from about a year ago. Um, at the conjunction. And all it means is that in their orbits, Jupiter and Saturn were close to each other. Um, of course, you know, they're still many, many miles, I mean, they're far apart, but on the sky, they look like their project, projected positions are close. Um, and here you can see the moons of Jupiter and the moons of Saturn, the rings of Saturn, okay? And this is just, you can see this with, with um, binoculars on a tripod, okay, if you go out. And you'll, tonight, you go look, you'll see the bright thing, look at it with binoculars and you'll see these moons, okay? This of course is a fancier photo um, taken from, I actually, I forgot to double check. This might be a Hubble Space Telescope, but it might also be one of the uh, uh, spacecraft that went there. Um, these are the moons of Jupiter up close. Um, this, if you look at, if you come back every night and look at Jupiter, you'll actually see the moons moving because the rotational periods are like days. So if you look every night, you see these things moving. That's why it was so obvious to Galileo. And if we go back in his notes, you see here, Here's his notes of when he's observing, when he sees night after night, these things moving, okay? And so this is, you know, you, you can do this astronomy from home. I just want to call out one of the planets, um, which is Europa, which is the, actually the smallest of the Galilean moons. It has two times more water than Earth. And it's, um, all the water is locked underneath an icy shell. And it's one of the best places we think of in the solar system to go look for life, not on Planet, our planet Earth. Uh, so that's just one thing I wanted to call out. Okay, next on our little whirlwind tour is Charles Messier, who was a Frenchman who lived um, at the end of the 1700s. And he saw Halley's Comet and decided to devote his life to uh, studying this, the sky and looking for more comets. 
in the process of doing so, he was making a list of kind of fuzzy blobs in the sky that didn't move. Okay, and these were the Messier objects. And here's all there's like 80 of them. Um, and these were the objects. I'm just going to show you um, the, what these objects look like up close. So this, these are typically from a Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but these are nearby things in our in our galaxy, nearby to us. Um, this is the Crab Nebula. This is a supernova remnant. So this is the remnant of an ex a dying exploded star. This is a stellar cluster. Um, and two, the Pleiades. This, if you look at Orion and you look at Taurus and you look at the tor tail of Taurus, this is a zoom in of the Pleiades star cluster. This is the Eagle Nebula. This is taken with Hubble Space Telescope. Orion Nebula M42. This is in the, the belt of Orion. If you zoom in, um, that's one of my favorites. Um, this is the Ring Nebula. So this is a the the remnants of a dead star. Okay, so these are the Messier objects. And now I'm gonna. This is um, also one of them. This is M31. This is Andromeda. Okay, and this is a photograph I just took with my camera. I pointed up at the sky. And let's see if anybody, well, normally if we're all in person, I'd be asking you if anybody can spot the thing, but look here, you see that fuzzy blob? These are all stars and you see they're point-like, but see there, it's a fuzzy blob, okay? That's M31 Andromeda. Here's a slight zoom in of it. Now, this was a mystery about a hundred years ago. Um, a big development in astronomy was, that is, was the technology of photography. Now, what astronomy enabled people to do was take a picture and share that information and discuss it with others, okay? It could transfer this information. Whereas before, it was only the person looking through the telescope and what would they do, describe it to their friend? I saw planets, oh, little dots going around Jupiter. You wouldn't believe it, really? You know, and I saw a fuzzy blob. You wouldn't believe it, it had spirals, really? But with photography, they could record it and then share that information. The other thing that it enabled is you can take a deeper exposure than you can see with your eye. You can open the shutter and keep collecting light. Okay, so you can see things much fainter than you can with the naked eye. So these two things changed the world of astronomy and continue to do so today. So this was the development of photography and astrophotography. So putting a, a, a camera on a telescope. And this was one of the first images taken in astronomy. And this was taken by Isaac Roberts in England. Um, and this was of that Andromeda spiral nebula. They didn't know what it was at the time. Eventually, professional astronomers um, started taking more and more photos of these. In the end, they'd taken about 100 of these nebula, and they had images like this taken all over the sky. And there was a debate raging of what they were, okay? And a famous debate was held in 1920 at the first assembly of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, uh, and this was called the Great Debate. And this was between Harlow Shapley, who was the chair of the Harvard Observatory, and Heber Curtis, who was uh, director of Lick Observatory. And so these were the two most eminent astronomers in the US and the world. And they had a debate as to what these objects in the sky, these nebula were. And Heber Curtis said that all of these nebula are island universes, okay? So at the time, the universe was thought to be the Milky Way that encompassed the entire universe. And so he said, look, these blobs that we're seeing outside are other universes out there. Now we would call them galaxies, but at the time we call them universes. Harlow Shapley, who was, again, uh, ran Harvard astronomy, basically, uh, said that, no, 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 that's crazy. The Milky Way is the entire universe. And Andromeda would have to be millions of light years from Earth. And just the concept of other island universes was just too crazy. So they debated. Most people at the time thought that Harlow Shapley won, uh, but over time we know that Heber Curtis was actually more correct. This was eventually settled a few years later by Edwin Hubble. So Hubble um, got his, received his PhD not, not far from here at University of Chicago. And actually he was doing his research at Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin. And after he got his PhD, he took a job at, uh, in, at Mount Wilson outside of, above Pasadena, so right outside of Los Angeles, on what at the time was the fanciest telescope ever built by humans. And this was the 100 inch or 2.5 meter Hooker telescope on Mount Wilson. And it was from, it's, it started taking data, it had saw first light in 1917, and it was the most powerful telescope on the planet until 1949. So in 1923, Edwin Hubble used this to measure the distance to Andromeda, shown here in the upper right, which are the modern CCDs. Um, and he showed that indeed it was uh, millions of light years away. Okay? 
Um, and this completely revolutionized our understanding of the universe and our place in the cosmos. So we realized instantly that the Milky Way was just the galaxy we happened to be in. And there were galaxies all over throughout space. So it, it made humans so much more smaller. Not our, only are we just on a little rock going around a, a star among 10 billion stars in the Milky Way, but there are tens of billions of galaxies. Okay, So instantly the universe was, you know, infinitely larger than we had previously assumed. So this is Andromeda. This is the closest spiral galaxy to our own galaxy. And this is 2.5 million light years away. Um, it has the mass of about 1 trillion suns. Um, and uh, it, it looks actually pretty close to what our Milky Way looks like. Um, they're, they're fairly similar. So if we could take a picture from outside our Milky Way, it would look similar to this. Of course, we can take a picture from the inside of our Milky Way. And that's what you see when you're looking at the Milky Way in the sky, which I know um, it's difficult for people to see these days because of light pollution. But if you've ever been to the desert or even just away from civilization camping and look up at the sky, you'll, you'll see this. And it's amazing. It, it, it's um, a really powerful image to see with your eyes. Um, this is an image um, taken from a telescope on the ground of our Milky Way. Now, this is as we would see it on the sky. We can change the projection and make it flat. So this is us looking through our own galaxy from the inside, okay? And the galactic center is there. And if you zoom in there, there's actually a supermassive black hole in the center. We believe there's a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. And there is one at the center of ours. Um, this laser happens to be pointing to it because they're studying it with these telescopes. Okay, so like I said, when we see the Milky Way, we're looking at a galaxy from the inside. And on the sky, you know, we see it as this, and this is kind of how we're sitting. Another way of, of thinking about it is we're out here in the suburbs. We're like in, you know, we're not anywhere near the center of the galaxy, which is a good thing because it's very energetic. Um, so we're, it's flat like a pancake, like the solar system. We're out in the suburbs looking through it, okay? That's our place in the galaxy. It's about 1,000 light years thick, meaning that it takes light 1,000 years to travel Across the thickness of it, and it's about 100,000 light years across. So it takes light 100,000 light years to travel all the way across the galaxy. Um, I'm going to skip that. Okay, Hubble didn't stop there. He started measuring the distances to many of these nebula, and, and this is where he was not the most upstanding scientist, he borrowed without credit velocity measurements from another uh, uh, astronomer called Vesto Slifford. Um, and he made this plot called the, the Hubble plot, which is he plotted the distance of the galaxies um, and the velocity that they were moving. And what he found immediately is that on average, the galaxies are moving away from us. And the farther away you look, or the farther away the galaxies are, the faster they're moving always away from us. Okay. And so, I mean, this was totally revolutionary because forever people had assumed that the cosmos were static. That those were always sitting there like they had been for eons. They never changed. And here we see that the universe is actually expanding. That's what this means. Okay. Um, and this is profound even today. And this was discovered nearly a hundred years ago. So this is the, this is why Hubble's famous. Now I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to one of the greatest pictures ever taken by humans. Um, this is an actual photograph. This is taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is uh, an exposure that took about a month to make. So Hubble, the telescope, opened the shutter and stared for a month and took this picture. Um, what I think is amazing about, well, I'll get to a number, number of reasons why this is amazing. One of the things is that JWST, JDB, when it goes up, it will also take a deep image like this and we will have an even more incredible photo. Um, what I want to emphasize here is this is a photograph, okay? humans put a camera on a telescope up in space and took a photograph. That's all this is, okay? It's an honest picture. Okay, every speck that you see, except for a few things like these really bright things there, 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 those are stars. Everything else that you see is a galaxy. Now for scale, imagine that you have a pea in your hand between your fingers and you hold it at arm's length onto the sky. That's how big this image is on the sky. It's a tiny little speck, a fraction of a full moon, okay? So this is a tiny empty patch of sky that we stared at and took the deepest picture ever made. And everything you see in here is a galaxy. Now, one more thing I wanna point out. Light 
travels at a finite speed, okay? So the farther away something is, the farther away it is, the, the longer the amount of time it's taken for light to reach us. So I'm not seeing, um, well, if we were all in person, I'm not seeing you as you are, I'm seeing you as you were like a nanosecond ago, okay? When I look at the moon, I'm seeing as it was a few seconds ago. When I'm looking at the sun, I'm seeing as it was minutes ago. When I look at these galaxies, I'm seeing them as they were billions of years ago because they're billions of light years away, okay? So a telescope is a time machine. Look farther away and you're looking back in time. Now, we assume that the universe is uniformly distributed and the same in all directions, because that's all the evidence points to that. And so we're not seeing, you know, we can't see like Earth back in time, but we can see a galaxy that would have stars that might have Earths like them back in time, okay? So this is a history picture. This is a baby picture of our universe. And we can see it the further, the galaxies that are further away, we're seeing them as they were when they were being formed when the universe was a mere billion years old. Now, currently the universe is 13.7 billion years old and we can see back to about 13 billion years here. So we're seeing all the way back to the beginning of time. Um, zooming in, oh, and the, yeah, okay. So zooming in, I'm just randomly zooming in, but I recommend that uh, some sometime this weekend, just Google Hubble Deep Field. You can download the full resolution image of this, it's big. Um, you own a copy of this because you paid for it. Um, this was taken by NASA, which is taxpayer money. And so all NASA images are public. You can do whatever you want with this image. Um, but if you just download it, look on your computer, zoom in and start scrolling around, this is what you see. Every speck in here is a galaxy. Every galaxy has 10 billion stars. Every star has planets around it. So you can, on a napkin, do the math of how many civilizations you expect. Unfortunately, they're all very far away. And we're seeing them a long time ago. Uh, but this is the, the Hubble Deep Field. What's exciting is that James Webb is going to launch in a month. And one of the first things it's going to do is take another deep image that will look even further back in time. So James Webb is going to extend our image of what we can see. Um, and it will shed light on how galaxies formed, um, how they evolved over time, uh, and so forth. OK. So we've talked about briefly that the universe is expanding and Hubble discovered this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over in the interest of time. I'm going to skip over, but suffice to say, there are telescopes that you can look even further back in time, all the way back to the very beginning. And that's called the cosmic microwave background. Um, that's a whole nother talk. That's actually the research I usually spend most of my time doing. Um, it was discovered in uh, 1965. I can't see my screen, so I'm Thing, yeah, by Arno Penzias and Rob, uh, Bob Wilson, um, who were, they were PhD physicists. They work at, at Bell Labs. They worked for the telephone company, but back when it was a, allowed to be a state monopoly and they were required to devote 10% of their profits to basic research. Um, and Bell Labs has more Nobel prizes because of that than uh, most universities. Um, they, they also, a few years after this, the transistor was invented, which started the whole computer age. And that was also at Bell Labs. Um, so when Penzias and Wilson discovered this relic radiation from the Big Bang, which definitively proved that the Big Bang happened. And over time, um, we scientists have built better and better instruments to take pictures of that relic radiation. And it's literally a baby picture of the universe. So just like we can put Hubble up there with the, with the camera and take a picture of all the way back in time of galaxies, we can look even further back to the very beginning. And that's the cosmic microwave background. Um, the, over time, that image of the sky has gotten better and better, higher resolution. And this is currently the best image of the, the Big Bang um, taken by the European Space Agency's Planck satellite. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna skip over that. So we can see if we are here today, as we look farther Hello. away, we're looking further and further back in time. Hello. And we can look all the way back to the very beginning. Okay. Why do we go to space? Um, the reason we need to go to space is to get above the Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere makes the image that we see, hey, um, makes, sorry, the assistants are being noisy. Um, the Earth's atmosphere uh, makes it difficult to see clearly, and in some cases blocks the light entirely, which is a good thing if you're trying to you know, have DNA and live, like UV radiation, you don't want that reaching the surface of the Earth. 
um, but it's bad if you're trying to take pictures of stars and galaxies. So to, to get around this, we send telescopes up above the atmosphere into space um, so we can get the clearest view, okay? Um, and in, in, at some wavelengths, particularly the infrared, uh, no light gets through at all. So the only way you can take a picture is to go up above the atmosphere and into space. Um, in the 90s, NASA built four what were called great observatories in different wavelengths. Um, and each of these were multi-billion dollars. Most of them were launched in the space shuttle. Um, and the, uh, the first one was the Hubble Space Telescope, which launched in 1990. And depending on how you count, it costs somewhere between kind of two and 10 billion. Um, like, you know, there's the cost to build it and the cost to operate it, and the cost to upgrade it and so forth. Um, they launched and there were four great observatories. There was the gamma ray observatory, the X-ray observatory, and then the, the infrared observatory. Um, James Webb's Space Telescope is the next one after this. Okay, so that's, that's the heritage it's following. It. And it's kind of, uh, it's like, like as if Hubble Space Telescope and Spitzer Space Telescope had gave birth to a child, but it was a super child. Um, okay, to show you the different wavelengths and kind of the progression of astronomy over time and the ability for us to take an image, we're just gonna do a, a quick step through kind of um, a picture of one of, one of the most uh, impressive galaxies, the Whirlpool Galaxy over time. So I talked about how in the, so the original telescopes were typically owned by rich white dudes that had their own uh, means meaning they were like, so Lord Ross was a, was a Lord, okay? Um, he had enough time and energy and money to build his own telescope, so he did. And he would sketch what he saw. And this is a sketch of a spiral nebula. Um, this was, do I have the, I can't see the time yet, in 1845. So he looked through the telescope and sketched what he saw and then showed his friends, right? And there wasn't an easy way to reproduce this or for other people, for somebody else to see this, you would have to go to the telescope. And there was a great debate over whether this was even real or if he was crazy, right? This changed, of course, with photography, okay? Um, people could take an image and then share this and discuss it, okay? And even in the early days of photography, people still debated whether it was real, whether these images were artifacts of the telescope or some goofy thing going on or faked. Um, but over time, people became to trust this and it was reproduced. I mean, it was science. It, it turned into kind of amateurs with uh, photographs to science. Um, this was taken by the, the one of the, the first all sky surveys taken with photographic plates. This was the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey. You can go download all these and look at them. There's, there's old images of the entire sky. Um, and this was funded actually by the National Geographic Society. So this is the Whirlpool Galaxy um, with um, photographic technology. So this, and this is film. Oops, one way. So um, there's a sketch, there's film. This is the era of CCD technology. So this is taken from the ground with a two and a half meter telescope from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and this is with the Hubble Space Telescope. See the difference? That's from the ground with a 2.5 meter telescope. This is from space with a 2.5 meter telescope. See the difference in clarity? That's why you go to space, okay? You don't have the atmosphere um, messing up your image like that, okay? Um, and this is the spiral, gal uh, the Whirlpool galaxy on the left, that's um, with Hubble. On the right, that's in the infrared with Spitzer. So this is why we look at different wavelengths of light. We can see different things going on. So here, these beautiful black lanes are actually dust. dust we think of dust as kind of a nuisance around our house, like, oh, it collects on everything and you're gonna clear out the lint trap from your laundry. But in space, it makes for the most beautiful pictures um, because dust is in many different colors and it absorbs light, it gives contrast. Um, what we see here are lanes of dust, okay? The other cool thing that's with dust is that anytime there are new stars being formed or stuff accreting and falling onto a black hole um, or planets being formed, this always, always, always happens behind a veil of dust. So to look through that, we have to look in the infrared where we can observe the dust directly, not just let it block all of our optical light. So on the left is an optical image where we see dust blocking the, the, all the action happening behind it. And here we see the gl dust glowing in the infrared. James Webb Space Telescope will be like Hubble, but in the infrared. So it's all the resolution of Hubble, all the clarity you get from space of Hubble, but in the infrared. So we can see even further, even clearer. Okay. Let's walk through what Hubble is real quick. 
so that we know what we're seeing when we see James Webb Space Telescope. So this is an old image of, of Hubble, of the drawing. So this is the, the mirror would be right here. That's 2.5 mirror, uh, meters. That's a human for scale. And all the camera is here. So light comes in this way, bounces off this mirror, bounces off a mirror there, and then goes here into the cameras. Okay? And this thing's up in space, and it can maneuver to point at things. That, and also that happened to fit exactly into the space shuttle because also all during this time, the military was sending up even fancier Hubbles to look down and spy on the Soviets and whatnot. So when you think of fan, like telescope, astronomy telescopes being expensive or fancy, remember that the military has even fancier ones, even more expensive ones, and many, many more looking down. Um, and when they declassify that technology, as yes, astronomers use that technology to launch it in space. Okay, there was um, an error when they made Hubble and it could not focus. And so at first, when it was making pictures that look like this, they had to actually go up with a, a, a servicing mission with the space shuttle to fix it, to put in corrective optics. And so this was before the correction, this was after the correction. This is for a, a star, a point source. This is galaxies before the correction, this is galaxies after. So it was actually a national embarrassment. I remember I was a kid and there were like far side comics about it. It was kind of, they mocked it on the evening news, but eventually they fixed it and it's been up there for I think 31 years now. Um, and it's been one of the most uh, powerful and uh, groundbreaking telescopes ever built by humans. Um, okay, James Webb Space Telescope is much bigger than Hubble, okay? Um, I can, this is the size of the primary mirror of Hubble. It's about the size of a human, 2.5 meters. This is the size of the James Webb primary mirror, okay? So to make a mirror that big, first of all, you can't make it monolithic like this. It's many different segments put together to make one mirror. It's gold plated because it needs to work in the infrared. And it's not like a lot of gold. You just put a few, uh, a few atoms of, of gold on the top. Um, so don't think you're gonna steal it and make any money. Uh, it's, not, it's not that much. Um, uh, and this is, this is the view of it. So what we have here is the mirror. So light comes in this way. We'll bounce off the mirror, go to a secondary, go through that hole, and then all the, ca all the cameras sit behind there. This is a sun shield. This thing has to, this whole thing has to be cooled um, down to, I think it's about 40 Kelvin. So um, way below uh, zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, to do that, you have to build a bunch of shielding to protect it from the light from the sun. So basically this, the sun will always be on this side of the telescope to block all the sun's rays and the heat that it produces. So that's what you're seeing here. Now, another complication is that all of this has to fit in a rocket. Let's see where I'm going. Okay. And this is kind of um, my own personal history of, of rockets. These are the old rockets that we used to use like the Saturn V, which took astronauts um, on the Apollo missions to the moon and then launched things like the Voyager satellites and so forth that went and took pictures around the solar system. Um, many of the space telescope that you know were launched on the shuttle. This was like Hubble and Chandra. And then the Delta II is a much smaller version of the Saturn V. Um, this launched many of the smaller satellites like Spitzer and Wise and Kepler. Okay, these are, those are, and these are all retired now. These no longer exist. In fact, we, we don't act, we've lost the technology to build a Saturn V. We, we don't know how. This was basically hand built by engineers before computers and before CAD. So these were kind of hand built Ferraris of which I forget how many, something like 20 were built. Um, these are the current generation of rockets that are launching and these are the next ones under development, okay? The point is that the fairing, the size of this thing that you can fit things onto is about 4.5 meters diameter, okay? And you'll recall that the JWST mirror is 6.5 meters. And when you look at the sun shield, it's more like 10 meters across. So how will this thing get up into space? There's no longer the shuttle, it wouldn't fit anyways. Um, and all of these rockets are too small to fit it. So it has to fold up like origami and fit in the fairing. Then the rocket will go up, it will open up, and then the telescope is going to unfold like origami. And this turns out to be a very risky operation. Because if anything fails, like for instance, um, the mirror un doesn't unfold properly, it won't make an image. It'll be like this Hubble disaster all over again, where the most expensive, fanciest telescope of all time gets up there and takes blurry images, okay? So this is a super risky. If the sun shield doesn't unfold properly, the thing can't get cold, the camera won't even work. You won't be able to take pictures. 
So all of these are very risky operations. Um, and there has to be a lot of redundancy in the design. They have to be tested extensively. And all of this testing and redundancy makes these missions complicated and expensive. It's already one of the most complicated instruments humans have ever built. And you, you can't allow it to fail. You get one chance to make it work perfectly. So it has to be tested and tested and tested. And that's really what makes it expensive and takes so long to build. This is how the sun shield um, will deploy. So soon after it leaves Earth, um, it will um, move out from the rocket, um, from the, the main rocket, and the sun shield will start to deploy like this. There are animations. If you Google JWST animation on YouTube, um, you can see all this much fancier than this. Um, and then after that, the mirror will deploy, it will unfold. Okay. And then, then it will go through a series of checkouts to make sure everything is working properly. And then actually not to humble boast, but the first thing it will look at is actually my project. And then they will look at the, the objects um, for the people that built it. And then it will be opened up to all of the first astronomers that put in proposals to use it, of which I'm really proud my grad student will be one of the first ones. His proposal was accepted. Um, and, and then this continues on for uh, about 10 years of, of observing, hopefully longer. So what will JRST see over Hubble? This is a simulation that shows a real image from, so this is a real image from the Hubble deep field. And if you zoom in, this is what Hubble saw of a faint galaxy. This is the image that uh, JWST will see. Okay, so this is a simulation, but, but you get the idea. So JWST will see even clearer because it has a larger mirror and it will see more things because it's it works in the infrared, whereas Hubble only worked in the out. So James Webb will see even further out to the um, out to the first 200 million years of the universe, um, and the universe is is currently. 13.7 billion years old. Okay. Um, oh, I'm actually doing fine for time. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do one little detour here. And just cause we're hitting all the greats, we hit Galileo, we hit Hubble. Now let's do Einstein. So in 1905, Einstein was a 26 year old patent clerk. Um, and he was an effectively an amateur physicist. He wasn't a professional physicist. And he wrote four papers in that year while sitting working at the patent office. He wrote a paper that um, uh, hypothesized and had a theory that light is made of photons, which are discrete packets. That was effectively the birth of quantum mechanics. He wrote a paper about the random motion of particles. And he um, said that it was, uh, he explained Brownian motion, which was known once people invented the microscope, they saw that when you looked at really small things, they were always jittering around. And he said that this jittering that was known was due to molecular action. And this was basically the beginning of atomic physics. Then he said that light always travels at a finite speed, which is the speed of light. <laughs> and that's special relativity. There he founded the field of relativity. And he said that energy equals matter times the speed of light squared, which means that matter is interchangeable with energy. And that started the nuclear age. All of this from an amateur physicist 26 years old, working from a patent office. Not a bad year. I, I won't tell you what I was doing when I was 26. Um, okay. Um, in 1915, he modified this, his theory of gravity and came up with the general theory of relativity, where he described space time. And so he said that gravity is actually just can be described as a distortion of space time, and it can bend the trajectory of light. This was almost immediately confirmed to be true by looking at the motion of Mercury around the sun. It was confirmed where people were unable to accurately predict um, the orbit of Mercury and people, it was a curiosity. Newton's laws didn't quite work. And it took Einstein for us to correct Newton's law to understand that it was due to relativity. Okay, um, another prediction is that space time well, this is actually the same prediction, but um, it was predicted that if you could look at massive objects out in space, they would also bend light and you would have this effect called gravitational lensing. Okay. The basic idea is that you have a massive object that's distorting space time through its gravitational um, uh, mass. And if you have an actual image lined up perfectly with this massive image or a real object, the light from that object will be bent by the curvature of space-time from the gravity. 
Okay. And so what you will see is not the object there, but it'll appear as if the object is over there. And you'll also get an image over there. Okay. Put in kind of three dimensions. Um, we have a telescope, we have a massive object, we have some background object, and what we'll see is an image that looks like this. We'll see the foreground object, and instead of seeing the back, and the background object would normally be obscured by that foreground object, but instead that light is bent around it, and so we see a ring around it. That's called an Einstein ring. Here's an image made with Hubble telescope of one of those Einstein rings. So here we see a foreground galaxy, and then a background galaxy being distorted and magnified by this gravitational effect that Einstein predicted, okay? This is called gravitational lensing. It works just like a lens in a camera. It bends light. This allows us though to see objects that are further away and it magnifies them. It takes this galaxy and stretches it out so we can see it in greater detail and we can see it uh, in, well, we can see it in much greater detail. Let's leave it at that. Um, and this is an actual photograph of that effect. Um, these are some images that, that I took um, with Hubble and another telescope on the ground called ALMA, and you see the gravitational lensing. Um, and this uh, is what JWST is going to look at first, is two of these galaxies. I, I think this one and maybe that one, I actually forget exactly. Um, and this is going to be one of the first things that JWST points at, and we're going to do that so we can study both that foreground galaxy in blue and that background galaxy in red. Um, in greater detail than we've ever seen before. And what we hope to do is resolve individual clumps of gas and dust and stars that are in the process of forming and understand exactly the processes that the galaxies form and evolve over time. So that's, that's what we're doing. Now, JRST, which isn't launched yet and has been in development for 30 years, um, but should launch in another month, isn't the end of the road. NASA is already planning and building the next telescope after that, the next one is called, oh, this is an old slide, I forgot to update it. It was called W first, it's been changed to the um, Nancy Roman Space Telescope, so now called Roman. Um, and she was instrumental to uh, the uh, development and success of Hubble. That's why it's named after her. Um, and this is actually really similar to Hubble. It was one of those leftover military mi mirrors that was donated to astronomers. And it's going to be put on, uh, have a state-of-the-art camera put on it. And it's going to be about a thousand times more powerful than Hubble. Um, so it's the same, effectively the same mirror, but it can see more area at once. And the camera is much, much bigger. So for comparison, that was the field of view, how much the Hubble camera could see at once. And this is the size of the JWST camera. This, every square here, is the size of the Roman camera. Uh, uh, camera, the camera on Roman. So it will see much more than Hubble. And it will take basically a Hubble deep field, like the, the image of the Hubble deep field that was like that big on the sky. Um, w first will do this over thousands of square degrees. So like 3% of the sky. So a, a huge, many, many full moons um, compared to Hubble, which did a fraction of a full moon. So that's what's coming next. And because these things take 30 years to plan, NASA is already planning the thing that will come after JWST and after Roman space telescope. And this actually, the, the decision should come out actually in the next week. It's supposed to be out in the end of September. So kind of any day now, literally. Four different missions were studied. And it was, they were put in reports for um, what science they were going to do, what wavelength. They put in this, uh, conceptual designs, kind of preliminary designs for these. And these were put forward by a special committee that we're going to evaluate all of them and decide which one was so important that it should go first. But basically this program looks a lot like NASA's program from the 90s where they do a series of great observatories. Each one focused on kind of a different wavelength and a different specialty. So the four being considered and studied and designed are called Lynx, this is in the X-ray, Levoir, which is like Hubble on steroids, Habex, which is supposed to look for Earth-like planets, and origins, which is like super Spitzer looking in the infrared. So this is kind of a combination of Spitzer and JWST. This is like a common, this is like a super Hubble. This is a super X-ray thing. Um, so these are the four that are being studied um, and which one gets to go first, should, we should find out kind of any day now. It's really exciting. And full disclosure, I worked on that one. So I have a favorite, but all, all of these will be really exciting. And, in the lineage of kind of how far we can look, Hubble Space Telescope, which was a 2.4 meter 
and um, was cooled to about 260 degrees above absolute zero and was in a low Earth orbit, um, could see out to about redshift kind of nine. So when the universe was about, uh, this was looking at about 13 billion years ago. Okay. Um, James Webb Space Telescope, which should launch, um, this is an old slide you can see, should launch in a month, um, is cooled to 50 Kelvin and is a 6.5 meter telescope um, and should see out all about to about a redshift of 12, which is when the universe or about 13.4 billion years ago. Um, and we'll see to the um, first dawn of when the first st stars turned on and the first galaxies formed. Origin Space Telescope, which is one of the ones that will come you know, in the 1930s, well, sorry, 2030s, um, is a six meter, basically the size of a James Webb Space Telescope, but is cooled all the way down to four degrees above absolute zero and can see even further back in time to the, not just to the first stars, but to the first clumps of clouds forming stars. Um, so we'll see even further back in time. So that's all I have. Um, I, we can talk questions now um, and you can ask me anything you want, okay? Thank you so much. That was so amazing information. Thank you for sharing all of that. We had a couple of questions come through so I will be your official MC. And we do encourage folks you could use the chat feature. You can use the Q&A feature. Um, folks in Uptown, if you've got any questions, you can stop by and you can ask us some questions as well. Um, one of the questions that came through um, earlier when you had those slides showing the folding of the telescope, you had mentioned there is a chance that those mirrors could break. Something could go horribly wrong. Um, you had also mentioned Hubble. When Hubble had that focus issue, they were still able to go up and repair Hubble. So if JWT breaks, do we have any way to repair this or is that it's done and over? Um, that's a very good question. So as of today, if it breaks, it's done and over. But NASA is working really hard on serviceability. And so all of the previous, so when I told you there were, there were uh, four missions being studied now, we were given instructions to plan and assume for serviceability. Basically what this is going to look like is you're gonna send a robot up um, on a rocket that will fix things. Um, right now, the, so where these telescopes are going, and I, sh I should talk about that. Um, the shuttle was an impressive tool because it could go up and send humans, astronauts up to a telescope and they could get out and with their hands fix things. Um, Hubble was in low Earth orbit. All of these other satellites and telescopes are in are far away from Earth at the what's called the second Lagrange port point, which is nearly a million miles away from Earth. And um, we've never sent humans that far. We've only sent humans to the moon, and we actually don't have that technology to get to the moon today. We've lost that technology. We don't have rockets big enough, and we don't have the modules to get people there. So we could not physically send a human to L2 the second Lagrange point, but we can send robots. So the assumption is that we would send robots, but yeah, if it fails, that would that catastrophe. And so wow. that's why they put so much effort into making sure it doesn't fail. Talk about a low pressure job. Exactly. <laughs> um, fantastic. We had some other questions coming through about your research. So, you know, in this realm of what you do in your work and your field, you never know what you're gonna find. You know, you make a hypothesis, you think you know what you're gonna find, you get the images, you see something else. What are you most excited that you think you will see versus something that would just be crazy to see, but maybe it could happen? Um, it could be like your research, something that your students are doing, but kind of like from your lab's perspective, what do you, thinking like we'll, we'll, we'll probably see something like this out there. And From then is there anything specifically or anything? Anything. <laughs> oh, anything? Okay, so I think the, I, I think the biggest, me personally, and this is just my own perspective, is not actually even what research I do. I, I study the beginning of the universe and the first galaxies. If we found life anywhere in the solar system, that changes everything. Because right now on Earth, anywhere we look, literally anywhere on earth you look, you find life. Places that for years, biologists assume life can exist there. They look there and there's actually life, extremophiles. 
So everywhere we look on earth, we find life. You go down, you dig a hole, the deepest hole in the earth in solid rock, and you bring up a sample, there's life. You go to Antarctica and go down to the middle of the ice sheet, you find life. You go to the bottom of the ocean, you find life. You go to an, uh, a volcanic vent and you see life. Everywhere we look, we see life. And why is that? Is it special? Is Earth this magical place where life happened? Is it the only place, you know, and think about when we look, where's my, where's my Hubble Deep Field? I mean, look at how vast all this is. That's a little speck of, of the sky. Every one of these galaxies has stars. Every star has planets. Are we it? It'll be impossible for us to answer that in a galaxy. They're too far away. But if we look around our backyard, our solar system, if we find life, anywhere else on earth. If we find life, I get there, wait for it, around one of these moons of Jupiter, under the ice of Europa, or if we find fossil life, like microbes that are maybe gone now on the, in the sands of Mars, it means that life's everywhere, everywhere, all out there. And if we find nothing, it might mean that we're alone. And that to me is a huge question right, of, of how we came from. So me, I've spent most of my career kind of trying to understand where we originated in the physical realm. So why we got here from the Big Bang and how the stars and galaxies formed. Um, but you know, frankly, if I were starting over, I would wanna know about life. And I, I think that's a really exciting frontier now. But I mean, all of these are important questions, right? The big questions. Um, and I know there's so much stuff that this telescope is going to help us understand and answer and pictures that, you know, we would have never thought we would see, be able to see that far back in time. It's going to be amazing to see what this telescope is putting out, which leads me right to our next question. How long I, is it going to be? on that for one oh, second? Before you yes. So on that point, when Hubble was built, we hadn't discovered dark energy. We knew that the universe was expanding. But one of the discoveries that Hubble made that wasn't on the radar at all when it was designed and built and launched is that the expansion is accelerating and that's due to dark energy. We don't know why, we don't know what dark energy is. All we can observe is that not only is the universe expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. And so that's an example of a thing when you built a, build a really precise, complicated, powerful instrument like Hubble or like James Webb Space Telescope, the most interesting things you discover are not the questions you thought you were going to be asking. And so th those are the things that I think are, are most exciting. The things, these answers to questions we didn't even ask, right? That's what real discovery is. And that's what kind of blows our mind. So those are the things I'm looking forward to. The questions Absolutely. I don't even know you have. I feel like that's like all encompassing of science of you go with a hypothesis or a question. And the most interesting part is always what you didn't expect to find what you did not even see coming and you forget that original hypothesis altogether. Uh, Chris have a great question just asking about how long will it take for the telescope to get to its destination? Oh, good question. I think it takes about six months. Um, and I think it was on that slide. I think it was on that slide. But it, it's usually about six months to get to L2. Um, does it say? No, it doesn't say uh, it's a, a million kilometers away, but not. it doesn't tell you. Um, oh, there, day 29, 30 days, 30 days. Um, and I think I think there's they have to wait for it to cool down and do some checkout. So I think the first like six months is kind of checkout, um, but I guess it takes a month to get there. Okay. And then I know in your talk, you had also mentioned, um, like what we were kind of talking with your background too, that these pictures will be made public, they'll be accessible. Are these going to be just for researchers? Are they going to be on NASA's website? How is NASA planning to disseminate this information, I guess, is really the question. So all images that NASA has ever taken are in the public domain and you can have access to them. Usually on a telescope, because our field is competitive, um, you get a proprietary period. So when you apply for time on Hubble, they give you, usually I think it's 18 months of only you can see it and then it's released to everybody. Um, and it's not like the public we're worried about, it's our competitors, like the other professors that are gonna try to scoop you. Um, but with the first images taken from JWST, like 
it's public immediately. So all of my competitors get the images I proposed for, but that that's fine. I mean, it's 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 made so that all of us can learn how to use it and find any problems with the data or with the instrument, you know. And so I I totally support the data being made, well, A to everybody, but you know, everybody should have access to it. And and that's what NASA does. Yeah, and we work with educators here at the center. So we are always excited to share with them different resources that they can share with their students. We had teachers really excited for this project. So we'd be happy to share with them later different locations on NASA to look at some of these telescopes images because we're just as excited to see what these pictures are going to look like when they're up. So really great stuff. Um, sorry, we had so many questions. I'm trying to dig through. Let's see. Da -da -da. So as these telescopes keep getting stronger, is there any limit to how far back we can see? Or do you think like the this field, are we going to get to a point sometime where the tech just can't see back any further? Or do you think we're going to be able to keep going back further and further still? So this is an actual picture, an image of the oldest light in the universe. And how this was taken is if you just look past, if you look at longer wavelengths, um, you can see the radiation left from the Big Bang. You just keep looking farther and farther away, and it's at very long wavelengths, it's one millimeter wavelength we see at one micron. So that is the oldest light in the universe. We can see all the way back to the beginning. What we are trying to do now, and this is what a lot of my research is focused on, is to see signatures of what happened before. Because this baby picture of, uh, of the universe that we're seeing, so if you take, so the universe is 13.7 billion years old, okay? This picture is of when the universe was 400,000 years old. But if you take the age of the universe and make it um, scale it to the age of a uh, human lifetime, okay? So like takes instead of 14 billion years, you call it 70 years. This is as if we took a picture of the universe when it was one day old in human lifetime terms, okay? But we can see all the way back to the very beginning, we can see the imprint on the polarization in this image. And that's what we're working on now. And now we hope to see back to 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the beginning. And we hope to see the very instant that the universe, that inflation happened and that space began to expand. Um, what caused that? We don't know. We may never know. Um, what caused the Big Bang? We don't know. We're scientists. We're agnostic about this. It's just we can observe it. We can take pictures of it. And we can study it. And we're trying to figure out why it did that, how it did that, what it was made of at the time. Um, but so... That's where we're trying to see now. And another place where we can see is, I didn't talk about this, but all the particle accelerators like at CERN and at Fermilab up outside of Chicago, those basically see the early universe by taking atoms and smashing them. They recreate the conditions of the early universe. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're smashing stuff together. You make a plasma that's kind of recreating the conditions in the very early universe. Um, so those are all ways that we can see back sooner by recreating the conditions or by looking further back in time by looking at signatures left over. Um, but, you know, a, a thing that's kind of, I'm not afraid of losing my job because there's always a question beyond that. Every time you discover something new, there's always more questions it brings up. People thought we would never ever see the radiation left over from the Big Bang. Now, you know, I personally build cameras and telescopes to observe it. Um, and that's constantly getting better. It, that's an image of it. Um, now we think it's going to be really difficult to see, you know, all the way back to the very beginning, but maybe in 30 or 40 years, one of the kids watching here will carry this research on and make discoveries that we never thought we could make. And maybe one day we'll understand why the universe expanded, why it's accelerating today, what dark matter is, when the first stars formed, things like that, or if there's life out there. Absolutely. Well, with that final question, Dr. Beer, thank you so much for taking oh, the time to talk with us. We have one more. Today. We have oh, one more about, one? So, well, it just came up. Oh, in the yeah. chat. You know, why is yeah. the baby picture of the universe in that oval shape? So it, it has to do with, I have kind of a slide like this. It's just the projection. It's think of a map, okay? Like when we look at the, the earth is a sphere. I hope we're, we can all agree on that. Um, but when we want to put it onto a map, it's convenient to have it in two dimensions, okay? So we take that sphere and we cut it out and we lay it flat. And that's the same thing we've done here 
um, with the baby picture is we've actually taken a picture of the whole sky all around us and then laid it flat. So it's just a projection. It's how you project a sphere onto a flat piece of paper. Very awesome. Well, Dr. Vieira, thank you so much. And for everyone watching from Uptown, from home, wherever you might be watching and joining us from today, um, thank you for participating. This is going to be um, continued. We are actually gonna head now to the Uptown Day of Play event. Uh, so we would love to see, um, feel free to come by um, the education area. We've got different space activities. Um, Dr. Vieira is gonna be there to answer some additional questions as well with his official assistants. <laughs> that have been helping out this morning. Um, so we would love to see folks there. But again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Dr. Vieira, a very big thank you to you again for coming all the way from Champaign to talk with us today. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.